Greetings and salutations to all you folks out there. I've got a game for you today on Tabula Rasa. This is the four versus four version of the map. I know that the five versus five gets played a lot, but I wanted to do this game because it got posted and it has a lot of really high ranking players in it. I've been casting quite a few average Joes or lower games recently, and I wanted to get one of these in here. So hopefully we can have some good play habits to look at and some good things to evaluate in this game. Let's go ahead and introduce the players on the teams. This is left versus right on this map, and then we'll jump into the game. We've got Yorick on the north side. He is taking the burgundy in UEF faction colors. We've got Zaki Zak, the infamous as Seraphim. That is a 2200 rated player, game-breakingly good, but hopefully these guys can put up a good fight. And he is balanced by the only 1400 on the team. That is Hickstery taking Aeon in the southern end, and then Nequilich taking UEF in the mid. This map with this setup, the four versus four, there's not a designated air player. That means that each of these guys is going to have to build his own T1 interceptors and somebody at some point is going to have to make time for T3 air. Who knows who that's going to be? On the southern end, we've got Takedo, as always, taking Cyber, and I don't think I've ever seen him in any game where he was not Cyber. And then we've got Baby Rocket also taking Cyber, and I think that is the egg roll. Then we've got Seraphim is the choice for HCH. And last, but certainly not least, Mephi taking Seraphim as well. So we got a little more faction variety on the left than we do on the right, but it looks like everyone is set up well to play to their strengths. We've got a Mech Marine passing through the middle here. That is in Hunt of an Engineer. I don't think it's going to find one. This Engineer is, of course, heading for all of this glorious reclaim in the middle. Tabula Rasa has absurd amounts <laughs> <laughs> of reclaim in the middle of this map we've got a pool for each of the three lanes in the middle and then for the players on the north side we have a good wreck field on the north and south as well and this is a bit complicated whoever is on this slot or this which is the mirror ah first bomber out there well early bomber not first bomber that is going to do very nicely for some aggression and there's a mech marine or a hunter rather Picking off that engineer in mid before it can get anything reclaimed. All the way around the back with that one. My goodness, that is going to score some really nice kills in the back here if it can get to these engineers. There is an anti-air turret going down to fend off that bomber. And Mech Marine is in the build power now. Um, this beach right here is a complicated issue for this player because you only have... Is it six mass extractors? Yes, six mass extractors at your disposal on this side. For the mass to be split evenly, you have to capture these three mass extractors and hold this beach. If you get forced back across the water, it is disastrous. The consequences reach through the entire game. Once you lose this beach, it is just about impossible to regain your footing. <clears throat> And uh, this is a very late ACU movement. It is an advantage to be Seraphim or Aeon because then you can have your build power on this side and stream your tanks across. But with the way things are going right here, it's not looking excellent for Mephi at the moment. We do have some handy dandy hunters in the northern base though. Egg Roll or Baby Rocket, whatever you prefer, has sent a couple of labs up into this side to try and get at this base but it doesn't look like it's being too terribly successful a couple little build power items and nothing much else so we've got let's see count them one two three four engineers that were killed some of them by the hunter some of them by the bombers there was a second bomber that hit the southern side there and uh we got a two versus one in the middle here which way is it going we got baby rocket and white and orange that is HCH and Zok. Zok is walking across the pool here. I'm going to try to bite into the mass on the other side. But HCH is pursuing. You can tell that Zaki Zok has been more focused on reclaim than on damaging the other people. Because he has taken way more hits to his ACU than HCH has. Baby Rocket probably also dealt some of that damage. Down here on this side, Hickstery has actually pegged Taquito on the wrong side of the cliff. Uh, 
Takeda is going to have to walk either all the way around the outside or he is going to have to go into the water here. We've got Auroras coming across the water. Like I was saying before, that is a very powerful advantage for the Seraphim and Aeon. And then this is a cool move here. There are equal piles of reclaim for these teams. This is for um, an extra little boost for the corner player here because this mass is way far away out this way. We've got a couple of T2 transports and I think those are loyalists. So T3 land wrecks. It looks like Nekulich has actually dropped engineers on the other side to get that reclaim along with a couple of tanks. This was a brilliant maneuver right here. There is a Jester out for Baby Rocket, which is about the best response you can ask for. We're gonna pop that scout and then snag these engineers as quickly as possible, but it is far too late. There is a lot of reclaim that's fallen into the hands of the left-hand team. And as a whole, I think these guys have got the reclaim advantage. It looks like things have settled down a little bit, so we're gonna go ahead and check out the eco here. We've got HCH far, far in the lead with the most mass income by five and 2K advantage on score. He has, ah, uh, where's my reclaim counter? No! Since I got the patch, I didn't turn the reclaim counter back on. It is too late now, folks. I'm not gonna restart this cast. <laughs> um, I will be sure to turn that on before the next go round. Mephi's trying to throw down a couple of land factories here with the help of an engineer. There is a T1 artillery and a point defense online pounding away at Yorick's commander, but there's also a point defense here which is going to force Mephi to retreat ever so slightly. The build power over here, I'm kind of torn on. It does help to have factories near your fighting because units stream out and are available more quickly, and also if you're fighting at the factories, the factories act like an HP buffer. Some of the units that are firing at your forces will hit the factories or the factories will just straight up take shots. Ooh, there was another attempt to drop. That was actually a ghetto gunship, I think. It's gonna get taken down by interceptors. Um, the factories will act as a buffer unit, but at the same time, you're investing in build power on this side of the water when you could be building it over here and sending artillery across. The only advantage to these, I think, is the fact that you can build tanks on this side. It does look like Mephi is going to hang on to that beachhead, so I don't think it's a problem, but that is kind of a rundown of the pros and cons of building right there when the ACU is literally within firing range of your factories. All right, Nekulich is coming back in. It looks like those are, that is labs, I think. Kind of hard to see when the transport is on the move. Those are going to get dropped right here in the rear. Well, actually, way back in the rear. <laughs> it is the brave little mech marine trying to get at that mass extractor. Ghetto Gunship is going to toy around with these Mantis, taking out one for sure, possibly the second. We do have some interceptors in the general area. And they are going to be coming down fairly quickly. Mass Extractor down, which is a huge deal because that was actually on an upgrade. And there goes the Mech Marine drop. Transport is going to get shot down. More Mantis moving in. Those are not going to be long for this world, but that was kind of hilarious regardless of what the outcome was. I love Ghetto Gunships. They are so much fun to play with. Uh, T1 phase... They're incredibly useful for the point of the game when they're on the field, but they're kind of hard to use because you basically just have to hover over the general area where you want to hit and the mech marines pick their own targets. Once you get to tech two, that's when you can actually target stuff and the DPS on those is brutal. Problem is once you get to T2 air, there's probably flak on the field somewhere. One shot from a flat cannon will just obliterate all of the mech marines on the underside of your transport. So that kind of sucks, but it is fun to play with anyway. Mephi is dropping an upgrade here. That is minus 29. So that's probably gun upgrade. No, tack missile upgrade. Yes, tack missile upgrade on a T2 commander. He does have T2 power to support it. It looks like he is fine on power. 
He's gonna start building those tack missiles at full speed with the assistance of some engineers and start launching away at this base, which at the moment is completely and totally unprotected. There is a TMD going up, so hopefully it will come online soon enough to stop some of those tack missiles. Oh, this is the balance patch, by the way. This is um, the test patch for the new balance that is coming on um, FAF. And one of the things that they fixed was the tack launcher for the Seraphim Commander is no longer brutally overpowered. It can't overshoot the TMD quite so badly anymore. Um, no, I'm sorry. I am telling you wrong. Ignore what I just said. That's not in the balance patch. That is in one of the other patches that I was playing that someone was uh, making. It's Ithilus balance patch. Equilibrium, I think is the name of it, was the one that fixed that. So, Seraphim Tack Missile, still overpowered. I can understand why Mephi is abusing the upgrade. <laughs> and we have a tack launcher for HZH as well. So we've just got tax galore coming in here. That is going to hurt, hurt so badly the eco of these players. It looks like Yorick is going to take quite a punch from Mephi. And hopefully a couple of those tack missiles can be directed at Zok, who is already working on his second T3 mass extractor upgrade. Now, he's still slightly behind HZH on mass, actually by one mass per tick. HEH is doing very, very well for himself. Not yet sitting on a T3, but he is sitting on quite a number of T2s, and that does make the difference. Um, Zok is shortly going to overtake that and become the highest eco player in this game. Right now, oh, no, 91 for Hickstery. What is this madness? I think he is reclaiming. Yes, he's only... He's not pulling nearly that much. Okay, good, good, good. I was about to have a heart attack if Hickstery was pulling that much mass at this point in the game. I was about to say, he is going to pull a T4 out of his back pocket in a minute here, but that is just the oh-so-glorious reclaim that comes. Mephi has ACU TML, I think. Well, what clued you in, bud? <laughs> the fact that your mechs were dying? Um... Hickstery is doing that awesome thing where basically you just roll your units across the map and as you're going you reclaim behind and snatch up all of that tasty mass and that is powering his eco for all of these units that he's dragging with him. He does have the range and gun power upgrade for his ACU that is going to give him 35 reach I think and or maybe it's 40. I think it's actually 40 range and 200 DPS with the doubled firing rate. Very, very handy tool at the Aeon's disposal, especially early on in the game because it allows you to snipe off those T2 units that are coming in. We do have a stealth generator and a hoplite back here. That is the traditional setup for Cyber because you can hide those hoplites right off the edge of uh, visual radius, put the stealth on them so you can't shoot at them, and then deal tons and tons of damage to anything that dares to come in range. We've got a Corsair and Jesters on Hickstery. Interceptors coming in from his teammates to try to help out, but that Corsair is going to get a second pass, and if it lands two missiles on that ACU, the ACU is dead. There's the fire, and boom goes the dynamite. Hickstery is down. He made a good amount of progress. I'm impressed with how far he got at the T1 stage on Aeon especially considering the rough terrain and things that he had to work against, like the T2. But he did very well for himself. That is going to leave a gaping hole in the left side team, though. Takedo landing some beautiful overcharges on these pillars that are moving in. I hope they can kill that, because that's a halfway upgraded mechs. Always a prime target for disposal. And here comes attack for Yorick. Not quite, my good sir. Good try, though. So all of this is now protected by TMD. I think we are going to be fine. Mevi does have a whole lot of reclaim to sift through, though. And is going to help him out on his eco quite a bit, which he does need, considering the fact that he does not have very many mass extractors at all. He is trying to get a T3 online. I think he will be able to do fairly easily with that reclaim. But he is working on it. So... Nekulich is moving towards the south end. I always say it, and I always mean it. If you have an ACU go down, 
in a team game, you need to get on that as quickly as you possibly can because seconds are critical when you're rebuilding mass extractors and trying to recover from the death of a teammate. You do get a temporary boost from the reclaim on these. If you're building T1 mass extractors on top of T2, you can actually use the additional reclaim from these as your engineers are building to quick upgrade a T3 mass extractor in your base. And it looks like Neckblitch already has one. None of them are capped though. So if I were him, I would start another T3 mass extractor upgrade with some fairly heavy assistance on it and go ahead and split up these engineers to reclaim the mechs two at a time. You can knock out a good T3 upgrade very, very quickly that way, and it helps negate the fact that you lost a team member. To his credit, before his death, Hickstery did a ton of damage to Taquito's forces and base. So Taquito has been forced back well beyond the halfway mark here. And it is going to take a little bit to recover. He is dropping engineers, though, on this group over here. Not going to be a whole lot of reclaim there. And there's the flak. <laughs> That's what I was talking about with the flak killing anything on the underside of those transports. The first flak shot, most of the engineers died. A couple of more shots, and the transport itself went down. So well-placed flak there. If you can drop engineers on reclaim, you need to do it. Because if one engineer reclaims one T1 tank, it has paid for itself and anything after that point is gravy. And when you're dropping in an area that has several dozen wrecks in it, surely you can uh, reclaim a minimum of two wrecks per engineer and then you're ahead and you've got tanks paid for. So always good to send engineers in even if it is a suicide run. Uh, because you will inevitably come out ahead if there's any significant amount of reclaim. Got T3 on the field. HZH is going to be pushing some of those sniper boats. He is, look at the reach on that sucker. Unfortunately, it did hit the ground and not an actual unit. Not sure how that's possible. There it is. Possibly a slight inaccuracy that contributed to that. And T1 artillery going to wipe it out. Nice catch by Zaki Zak, sending T2, oh, this is going to be brutal. I like this, I like this a lot. Mephi has absolutely no defenses anywhere in his base, look at this. Totally empty, no attack units, no point defense, nothing. And Zak has seized the opportunity and he is throwing out a whole group of Yenzines, the Seraphim hover tanks, the speed on these is key. It is so overwhelmingly fast. You, it is very hard to react to. And those are going to flow right across the water, right into the base, and do a whole bunch of damage before anything can be done about it. Engineers are queued up to build point defense. Not sure why they aren't doing it. ACU is going to manage to kill a couple with an overcharge, but enough are going to get in here that it is going to make a huge difference. And you'll notice Zaki Zak dropped engineers down here as well. Picking up T1s, immediately upgrading to T2, and that's going to add to his mass in the bank, which right now is climbing 133 to HZH's 156. So HZH is still managing to stay ahead if ever so slightly. However, this play right here, I do love and it's going to do good things. Killed off the power storage, so that is no more overcharge for Mephi's ACU. There's a T2 point defense and other things going down down here. And for some reason, the Yenzines have ceased firing. I'm not... Oh, that's the four second reload. Never mind. When you decrease the amount of Yenzines, that uh, lead time on the shot is kind of misleading. It is, if I'm not totally mistaken, it is 200 damage per shot, four second delay on 50 DPS. So these things do have high alpha damage, but they do a pretty good job overall. So that was a T2 mass extractor, energy storage, uh, a fairly good little bit of build power and some power generators damaged. And then he is plinking away at this T2 mass extractor down here. So overall, and with the annoyance factor and the fact that it built, it pulled the, it, blah, 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 that's all folks. Um, it pulled the ACU over to the right hand side. Uh, I think that was definitely worth the mass in those tanks. And there comes the adventurous T2 
T2 engineer that is going to try to rebuild that radar, but I think is immediately going to get shot if Zaki Zaki is paying any attention at all. Uh, there is the radar coverage back online, and so that T2 point defense is going to zap that hover tank without too much of a problem at all. Got some T2 tanks on the southern side here. Baby Rocket is protecting his ACU and upgrading to T3. That is a excellent strategy as Cybern. You want to hit those T3 units as quickly as you can. It's actually fairly late in the game, but this is a heavy eco map. So these guys are teching up as quickly as they can. Um, once you can get T3 on the field, the bricks are overwhelming and the trebuchets are amazing. If you can get that Cybern T3 mobile artillery up, you can do brutal amounts of damage to any other groups of T2 and T3 that may be on the map. I know I've said this before, but it's always good to review things because there may be new people to the cast. Trebuchets do the least damage of any T3 artillery, but they have the most um, area of effect. Seraphim, I feel like, has the best balance of area of effect, accuracy, and damage, but the Cybern has the most area of effect. And what that means is if you fire a single shot into a clump like this, you're going to kill all of those engineers, all seven of them the total DPS delivered is far superior to the actual DPS number of the shot if you look in the unit database because even if you're only dealing you know 200 damage per hit if you're dealing 200 damage to seven units that is 1400 damage and that is amazing so always need to bear that in mind and that's what makes the cyber and artillery kind of awesome both at the T1 phase and at the T3 we do have a Demolisher online, UEF T3 Mobile Artillery. That is going to start firing at this base over here. Looks like it's going after the point defense first to clear up an avenue of access to all of the rest of this. And then it will start dealing damage to everything else, I would imagine. Got some T1 tanks moving across here. HCH still has some T1 on the field. Not building anymore, but he does have some. And we've got a quantum gateway going down. So it looks like rather than a T3 land push, we're going to be going for those SACUs, possibly the Rambo combination. I would love to see that. Um, the Rambo com for Seraphim is absolutely hands down the best for dealing with T4 units. It does have the overcharge ability. So as long as you have plenty of power to feed the overcharge on those ACUs, you can walk up with four... I think, yes, with four a SACUs and overcharge one time on a Monkey Lord, and that Monkey Lord is dead. It is an extremely powerful tool. It looks like Zaki Zak, on the other hand, is going for a mix of T3 and T4. He's got two tanks online, the awful Othams, which are going to lose part of their DPS to the rough terrain in here because their guns are so low mounted. Well, no, those are doing all right here ground is fairly flat in this specific area um, so these are going to be able to deal their full and total damage to these rhinos wipe them out very quickly and then wipe out this other off them hopefully as well and there goes the shots with the off them it's still one-third of the damage is on the outside long-range cannon and two-thirds of the damage is on the short range which I think is kind of silly but whatever Sometimes they still can be of use. Nice dodging from HCH, managing to keep that tank alive and pull it out. It's going to run into some T2 and T1, though. I don't think it has the HP to survive to a veteran C. Nope, there it goes. Dead as a doornail. And that was the entire summation of the T3 force of HCH. It's throwing down some more T3 power in the back. Possibly going to see air. I would hope so anyway, with building that much T3 power. It's either going to be a nuke or air, and good lord, look at Zaki Zak's bombers. He is stockpiling T1 bombers for some kamikaze run or another later on. And I don't see any T3 air yet. Looks like it's all interceptors at this point. Um, if you're engaged in a locked land battle where one side does not have a distinctive advantage over the other, in a lot of cases, the move to T3 air may not be worth it because you have four people to react to you. You have to kill several mechs to make a strap bomber worth it. And if the other team is not building T3 air, then your own ASF are not really doing a whole lot of good because you can intercept T2 fighter bombers 
most transports as long as you know where they are in advance and anything T1 with interceptors. So clouds and clouds of interceptors are actually pretty effective. Quite a fine looking base you got there, sir. I like Seraphim with the white trim. They have all the cool little designs and everything. And with the white trim, it just stands out so well. Some of the stuff, like blue, looks kind of weird because the colors kind of fade together, that steely color in the blue. But I do like white. I like white a lot. Um, the other one I like is uh, Cybern with the red trim, which is kind of evil looking, if I do say so. So this demolisher, actually there's two demolishers. Those are going to kill off the rest of those Ilshavas, and that means that this side of the map is now owned by the left-hand team all the way to the water and beyond on both sides. Got lots and lots of wall sections going down from this T2 engineer here. Those Percivals will be able to cross the water whenever they choose, and with just a few shots, we'll be able to kill off those wall sections. Or, let me let you in on a little secret, a lot of people, I, myself included, forget that this is a thing and you should totally be doing it if you have the opportunity. Just send an engineer across, reclaim their wall sections. It takes basically no time to reclaim the walls and you get that brilliant one mass back. <laughs> the wreck is only worth like one and a half mass. Um, but you can eliminate those wall sections very, very quickly with any kind of engineering unit, whether it be a Sparky or an SACU or your ACU or even just a lowly engineer. I'm going to see a Kamikaze t uh, T1 bomber run. It's probably going to go for the build power over here. Possibly for actual power. That is a two-thirds complete megalith for Baby Rocket. It's pulling 146 mass per tick. It looks like ACH is still leading with well over 200 mass income and reclaiming his way up to 332, although he's been at 332 for a while. Yeah, 287 pop into 332 with reclaim. So that is still a lead on Zaki Zak, which is honestly surprising to me. It is rare that I see anyone out reclaim Zak, or out uh, eco Zak. But, ah, there we go, we do have an answer. I was about to say, Zaki Zak does have an earlier T4 but that's not such a big deal because the T4 has to walk all the way from the base to the front and HCH is going to have his own online. He's going to be building shielding to protect his units and he's got overcharges landing from an SACU. So this uh, chicken is going to be at half health before it even really gets started. Brick coming in. These Lobos were a good idea. They are going to do a bit of damage to that T3 mass extractor, but overall not really going to do a whole lot of damage. That brick is just going to waste those things as efficiently as a T1 point defense does. SACU is taking quite a bit of damage from that lightning storm, but all of the units are still alive. We got 64k health on that Yathatha, and we have plenty of SACUs still hanging around to uh, harvest this mass and build whatever needs built. HCH is going to have to build something else soon or he is going to be overflowing mass because he's reclaiming fairly expensive things from a couple of different locations. we got demolishers coming up the middle here. Those are going to be able to hit some of these. And there's strats. Nice. Mephi is pulling strats out of his back pocket. He went T3 air all secluded back here in his little cubby hole. He's only got six mechs, but they're all T3. And he has plenty of resource allocation to get a little T3 air in the air. So that's going to be two strat bombers and a handful of ASF to his name. Which means somebody on the other team, and it looks like it is going to be Zaki Zak. Somebody else on the other team has got to go T3 now so that they have the interception capabilities against that bomber. Or those strat bombers, rather. It is plural. That is a terrifyingly large interceptor swarm. Not the biggest I've seen, but it is a pretty good sized one. Second Yathatha online and moving towards the south. He knows that there's a dangerous clump 
of SACUs in the north, and he knows that there's another chicken up there. So he is going to head around the south side. Looks like whalers might be a problem, though. I do dearly love whalers. I think they're one of the more underestimated units. They're pretty awesome to use. Um, last night, I was playing in a sentence, and I actually had the radar jamming work. The radar jamming on a group of whalers denied the entire first and second firing cycles from a few cruisers that I was engaging, and it did help with the survivability of them. They were able to kill the cruisers, and I did not lose all of my whalers. I lost several of them, but not all of them. I was able to do quite a bit more damage to that Navy. So I, I've heard it mentioned in the past that radar jamming is kind of a useless ability. I assure you it is not, especially when you have units with high alpha damage. Um, and the slow firing cycle because if they waste their first firing cycle on a radar blip that isn't actually a unit Then you've negated most of the damage of that unit at least for the first few seconds of the engagement So we've got the SACU laying down overcharges on the Percivals here and two T4s climbing from the depths of the pond heading directly for Zaki Zak and if I were them I would be doing exactly this they have to eliminate Zaki Zak if they have any chance of winning. They've already got uh, three T2 Mexes in addition to Zak's own Eco, which admittedly is still not as good as HCH's, but when you figure the player skill level into that, Zak is a dangerous person to have alive. This is exactly what you don't want to be doing, is firing your Yathatha into the rear end of your teammate's Megalith. If you're doing that, that means that you're not only not damaging their stuff, but you're also damaging your teammates' things. And that is not a very friendly thing to do. Holy cow, hello area of effect. That Megalith wiping out a pretty good portion of the build power there. I don't think that this Yathatha is going to get done. It might. It may. But I don't see it happening. And even if it does, it's already going to be very, very low on health. Well done, right hand team staying on top of things and getting in there and getting things done. So this you thought is coming in. I'm not sure what the answer is supposed to be to it. it. There are a couple of strap bombers in the air, but definitely not enough to kill that chicken. This is going to be interesting because this could be an ACU death right here. If we can land two overcharges, oh buddy, you need to target that ACU. Two more overcharges, and that thing is dead. If you can land enough damage, the lightning will kill the AC. Ah, there it is. Boom goes the dynamite. 2,000 health left on that chicken. That was a close one. Both ways. And strat bombers are going to kill it. Oh, well. Well, they did eliminate Taquito, and that is a huge help. Zox saying it is kind of over because he has two T4s on his doorstep, and I would tend to agree with him because he has absolutely no way to deal with those. we got to try and see if there's something else that can be done. Zaki Zak picking up that T2 transport, flying over here with his ACU, I think. Or else that T2 was dropped there for Zaki Zak. It's going to be given in a minute one way or the other. Strap bombers coming in. Those are going to start laying down some damage on that Megalith, which... It's got that beastly 110,000 health. I mean, it's not going anywhere anytime soon. And amazingly, the combined flak from the Megalith and the Athotha was actually able to take down a T2 gunship before it did hardly any damage at all. The flak cannon looks way more aggressive on that thing than it actually is. Like, the T1 anti-air is doing way more damage as, as far as the mass investment slot that it's taking up. A flat, let's compare it to a flat cannon. A flak from a mobile flat cannon um, does more damage than the Megalith does to air. But the Megalith cannon is like six times as big. Go figure. Yay for useless abilities on units. T2 gunships. A gunship full of tran... Uh, bleh, a gunship full of transports. Yes! Way to go, Brink. You English so hard. <laughs> a transport full of artillery was about to be dropped next to this you thought that which could hopefully deal some damage but is immediately going to get picked off by the flak on these two units 
and they are going to gradually chew their way through Zaki Zak's base. Zak is rapidly dropping on his mass income. Looks like he is going to end up with only those T2s in the south for support. Got some drops coming across here though that is going to give him a little bit of reclaim income and hopefully allow him to get out of this mess that he's in. So he's T1 artillery. Looks like they're trying to drop behind the Megalith and deal as much damage in that Alpha Strike as they can. Here comes the firing cycle. Going to deal quite a heavy hit with that high damage on the Lobo. And that Megalith's going to go down. Remember, the Lobo fires very infrequently, but that means the Alpha damage is super high. A couple of hundred damage per hit, or I think. It's like 280 damage per hit, I think. Um, so as long as they get to fire once right when they land, they're probably worth it versus a T4 like that that is starting to get low on health. Zaki Zak asking, does anyone need mass? And I know what you're thinking. He has nothing. Why is he giving mass away? Well, he has no build power and he has basically an infinite supply of mass at the moment because of that T4 or the two T4s that he has yet to reclaim and all of this other mess that's going on in other areas of the map. Looks like broadswords coming from Nequilich. And T1 anti-air coming online to combat them. Believe it or not, T1 anti-air actually has the highest DPS per mass investment of any anti-air. I do realize that it's direct fire, so you're not ever going to get the advantage of the area of effect like is on flak. But as far as single target damage, T1 anti-air is your man. And these guys are capable of hitting strat bombers, which is a huge deal. If you start getting flown over by tons of strat bombers, you don't have T3 yet, and your air player is AFK, then you can just start spamming strings of T1 anti-air, and they will sight in those strat bombers and fire very reliably, hitting most of the time. I don't know why I'm so sleepy today. I'm having trouble staying focused and cohesive. All right, Chicken is moving in here. Got T1 Air Scouts coming in, and I think this is about going to be a wrap in favor of the right-hand team. I Spy and Awasa. Looks like Mephi has very hard air control, and he is going to drop an Awasa on these guys. There is a second Awasa. Almost finished. Looks like he's going for the double bomb for a one-pass kill on Zaki Zak. Owasa's deal 11,000 damage or so to a target on pass. It's either 11 or 12,000. I think it is 11. Two together, that makes 22 to 18k health, so that is a kill. You don't even have to control the K, control K the thing into the ACU. I love T4 Mercies. I really do. They're so much fun to play with. Zaki Zak still has a few ASF online, but nothing that can even remotely challenge the air control that Mephi has developed. Yorick has the eco, he has the map control, he's just not really doing much. He's built a fat boy, which is going to head towards the south, and there's an ACU nuke. I missed it. Sorry guys. Nekulich going down to that monkey lord that climbed out of the water. Honestly, it didn't really matter at that point, because... He was dead meat anyway, no matter what happened. Um, <laughs> here comes the Owasas. Not doing anything. They're winging around the south side to go past the Sams. And here comes the bombs. It looks like he bombed his own AS. No, he didn't. All right, there we go. And there goes Zaki Zak. Something impacted those ASF. I'm not sure what it was. Zok is down, and it's only a matter of time for the rest of the team. We have the, um, there's the ACU, right there. Yorick is shielded, but he is going to be taking a lot of heavy fire from these bombers coming past. I think he's got enough to survive maybe three runs, and he is out of here. And that is GG, folks. Why are you trying to dodge? You know you can't dodge those. <laughs> the only hope you have of avoiding an Awasa strike... Well, he is dodging the strap bombers, I suppose. 
The only hope you have of dodging these is to run towards the bomber. Because if you run towards the bomber, occasionally you will screw up the firing cycle. Which is about the only hope that you have. Well, not a whole lot of spectacular plays, but solidly played by the right-hand team. Um, that was a good use of T4s, good use of reclaim. I wish I would add the reclaim numbers on this uh, as far as the early game reclaim because there is so much mass on this map that you can... You, there is definitely a correlation between who gets the early mass and who wins the game for sure and well done on these guys not freaking out in the face of a 2200 and teaming up and killing him with a pair of t4s that he could not possibly defend against well as far as his base goes so that is going to wrap up that game now one thing i do have to say i've gotten a lot of requests in the last few days for me to cast a sentence and here's the deal i've actually not had a whole lot of really fantastic replays provided I've had a lot of people send in good replays, and they're fun to watch, not necessarily fun to cast. And then as far as this game goes, this is about an average game that I get or is posted to the forum. Um, so if I'm going to cast a sentence, which a lot of you guys seem to be asking for, and it has been a very long time since I casted one, I need one that is 1,000 plus rated unless it's just hysterical stuff happening and then we can go minus 1000. I would prefer a sentence epic though. And then with the sentence game, I don't care how long it is, it needs to have a good bit of action because sentence is bad about having lulls where you sit for like 20 minutes and nothing happens. So if it can meet a couple of qualifications, by all means send in your sentence replays and I will cast one for the end of the week. And other than that, I just need replays in general because I've just about exhausted my back supply of them and uh, I'm always in need of a good, exciting replay. All right, that's going to wrap it up this time around. Hopefully this cast uploads without a problem. I've been having a little bit of an issue with my ISP. That is why the cast for Tuesday was a day late, or the game rather, because it was taking forever to upload. Hopefully that is not an issue. And as always, guys, thank you so much for watching and supporting the channel. And I hope to hear from you guys soon. I will see you in the next cast.